Okay, Scott, you ready? You ready for this? I'm ready, man. I'm ready. Okay. I just got off. And just With got all off. This, all this noise in the background that I can't help. Just pouring down with ice air, but everybody welcome to Your Crisis Coach with Scott H. Silverman, that very good looking elder gentleman with the gray hair. Not not the woman who is in the picture, the man, and then me, the one talking, the one with the mouth and not being able to talk over the now the noise that's echoing through my room. It is brutal right now can you even hear me yeah barely yeah barely yeah, yeah you, you might want to mute once she starts talking <laughs> that well it's gonna stop i can't believe it could hold up this much where is ice coming from why does it hail it's 90 degrees out huh. and it's hailing it's just I bouncing think. off the windows is this the end of the world scott <laughs> no, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be little half-inch round pieces of ice. It was the end of the world. It be a lot be bigger. Like, yeah, about two feet wide, coming at you at 100 miles an hour, and your power so, would go out. That's for sure. So, thank you very much for allowing me to have my one week away after my dog was unfortunately put down. That was something that we had to fight through an ordeal as a family, but we got through it. We're all very content. We're all very sad, but content because she was not well. She was suffering and we were able to eliminate that by giving her the best weekend possible and by putting her asleep nice and gently in her yard with all her toys surrounding her. And later on today, I'm going to get her ashes. And I've got a nice room. I got a whole room, her room, set up for her with all her toys and her ashes will be there. And that's it. So you brought a friend with you today. You want to tell us about your friend or you want her to tell us about her? <laughs> well, let's let's take a minute and uh, think about what you just shared there, Fred. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. I know how close you guys were. And um, I, I, I've, I've done that a few times myself with uh, our dogs. and it's. And I don't know how I get chosen. I'm not the one with the strength in my family, but nobody else wants to drive it. And, uh, you know, my, and my, we've had one vet for 30 years, so it's the same person helping us. So, yeah, it was interesting. It's a very interesting process with my daughter, who's the youngest daughter, who's 24. This dog was her dog since she was nine. So for her to go through it, she didn't contemplate it. She didn't take it well at times. She challenged me to where I wish I could have put her down at times. You know, she, she really pushed some buttons. She thought I was a little cold because I did not cry. I did not react. But truthfully, I wasn't sad. I, I was sad, of course, that I was losing my friend, but I wasn't sad that I was putting her down because she needed it. She, she was telling me to do it. And I was quite content with the process. The money didn't matter. I didn't care how much this cost. I was going to do it the right way. And my daughter's come around since then. She's she's dealt with it very well, considering. And the one thing she regrets, she had, she had a slight regret that she mentioned it was easier. It was easier losing her own mother than it was to lose the dog. But I told her, it's not a regret. That's just being honest. The dog never judged her. The dog was there for her. The dog didn't care if her breath smelled, if she was chubby, if she was skinny, if she was whatever, you know. Right. And it was an, uh, her mother didn't give her that. So that feeling is okay. It, it's quite okay. And I think over time, you should tell her the dog did really care, but wasn't willing to say anything because unconditional dog, unconditional love is what animals care for and they'll give it back to you. They process, I think, things differently than we do, but they're not about to text you about, about how they're feeling or. Yeah, their they're anger. not going to. Plus, I'm the one that feeds them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that helps. So let's talk about Lee. Let's All talk right. about the beautiful Lee. All right. Well, I'm going to just, I'm going to do a quick intro and then we'll, we'll jump right into it. You do that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our friend Lee. Hi. Lee, I'm going to let you tell the story 
And then I, I could say probably how you got here. You got here here on the show because we needed somebody young in their 30s. And <laughs> <laughs> that was, yeah, that was she? Willing, willing to come in on a Monday. Now, Lee and I have known each other for quite a while. And I'm going to let her tell the story. And you share whatever you want. And Fred sure. and I will ask you questions. And um, we'll, we'll hopefully make you a little uncomfortable. And then we'll make you comfortable again. And by the time you really get comfortable, we'll be saying goodbye. And thanks for coming. So, Whammo. Nice. Lee, tell us your story. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Fred and Scott. Uh, my name's Lee. And, uh, yeah, like Scott said, I've known him for I was counting down I think 16 or 17 years now and um you know it's he recognized in me uh that many years ago the addict in me my addiction of choice is alcohol and then whatever else would you know alter my reality so whatever drug um I did never I I never used IV drugs I'll say that um, and then, um, you know, I went to an AA meeting with him um, 13 years ago and scared me. <laughs> I wasn't one of those, you know, and I, I love the name of your, you know, breaking the stigma because I had this preconceived notion of what an alcoholic would look like. Um, so I just. I, went, I think I had maybe 120 days sober, maybe a little bit more than that. And then I went out and relapsed in a big, big way um, and uh, came back into the program a year and three weeks ago. And uh, yeah, it's been a life changer. You know, I've heard you hit your rock bottom. You kind of know when you hit your rock bottom, when you're ready to really accept the gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's where I was. And here I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, alive. So yeah, thanks, Scott. So that's all there is to it. Do you have a significant no. other? Do you have children? Do you have a couple of things that maybe because the people we believe in our audience, they're not all Fred's friends. Mm hmm. A couple are not mine. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. so what would people what, what should people hear from you and by the way congratulations on your one year and Fred mm -hmm. I know you're wondering hey was Scott the one that gave you your token on your one year no I wasn't no I'm going to work on that later you know in my life figure that out how that that happened she chose someone else so um, that's why we got her on here because we want to get even little guilt he's guilt you're going to get even with me <laughs> put those little funny glasses on her and the black so, but, but Lee, tell people, because people will hear this and, you know, and they'll, oh, she got a year. Look at her. You know, she's all put together. You know, it seems like she's doing really well. It's easy for her. She has no idea what I've been through. And, and not that you have to paint a picture of it, but, you know, that they, it, it's like anything. You, when you want it or you really need it or someone helps you understand that what you're doing isn't working and you need to pivot. Um, and that's usually what it takes, and it takes others. And that's, that happened for me in the fellowship. I think it happened for you. And, and you know, one day we're going to do an intervention on Fred, but we're, we're not sure when. It'll be he when just the hasn't admitted it yet. When the, when the weather, weather's better. You know, as he drinks his bottle of whatever, you know, and he's, uh, he sends me pictures of him having a big steak and a glass of wine just to hear it. He knows I love the steak. So... But but t tell us more about you and, and, you know, maybe where you grew up and siblings and, you know, little things like that. You have two minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, two minutes. I'll see you next week. Yeah, I um, I was born and raised in San Diego. I was born in Chula Vista. And um, my mom and my biological father got divorced when I was really young. I don't remember. I was like two or three years old. And um, then my mom got remarried to my stepdad. So I was raised by my mom and my stepdad here in San Diego in the East County. We moved to Santee. So I grew up in, you know, that whole East County area in San Diego. And um, 
And my stepfather was super controlling and he was an atheist and nobody had an opinion. My mother was emotionally not available and she also suffered from bipolar disorder, which you found out later. She was never diagnosed with it. Uh, but, you know, finding out about bipolar and coming back and looking at it in retrospect, absolutely, she was sick. Um, and um, <clears throat> so I was raised thinking my stepfather was my father. Um, and so my uh, my trauma came from accidentally finding out that I my stepfather who had been raising me for 15 years was not my father. That was the beginning of my alcoholism and my addiction right there. How, old, how old were you then? I was about 15. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'll fast forward to now. I'm 56 and I'm married. We've been married uh, for almost six years. We've been together for 16 years. And um, I have, I have two grown children. He doesn't have any children. Um, my daughter, Tara, is 35. Scott knows both of my kids. My son, Cody, is, uh, he just turned 34. They're 18 months apart. That's why it takes me a minute always to figure out their age. <laughs> um, and I have five grandchildren and I have number six on the way. My daughter has three kids. My son has two and a half. And I just couldn't be more proud of them. And, um, yeah, I'm, I, um, am a dog sitter. So, you know, we had started by talking about Fred's loss of his fur baby. I'm so sorry for your loss. And Thank I, you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. But that's, that's what I do. I, I, I sit at home with dogs all day. I go drop in on dogs. <laughs> it's my passion. I go to meetings. And uh, try to help other alcoholics who are in need. So with glancing, with the glancing past and all that stuff, explain to me some of the situations yet your husband, who's been with you 16 years, stayed through. Were there really bad times that he had to suffer with to stay through? Or is he also a drinker? Or Yeah, my husband is normal. <laughs> normal <Is laughs> we call normal? him normies in our world he's a normie and you know it's interesting because when we met he introduced me to fine wine and uh you know before i was just you know drinking the box or trader joe's two buck chuck right so our relationship started with you know whining and dining and um, that was a big part of our relationship, you know, going on trips to Paso for all the wineries and things like that with our friends. And um, yeah, there were some really bad times because he would drink normally. And I would I would probably be drinking double what he was drinking and then not quit and not know when to quit. And. I would embarrass him in front of his friends in call that he went to college with, you know, and he's in his fifties as well. I mean, just acting like a teenager saying super inappropriate things. And, um, yeah, I left him stranded in Las Vegas one time because I was doing cocaine. Sorry, my dog's coming down the hallway. I was doing cocaine and I was hiding it from him and also drinking. And he, um, yeah, he found out and he just went ballistic and lost it on me. And I was so embarrassed and so pissed off that I got in my car and I drove probably a hundred miles an hour all the way to San Diego from Las Vegas and left him stranded. Wow, that is, it is tough. So, so he's a keeper. He's a keeper. I mean, yeah, he is definitely a keeper. And if I can tell you what got me here a year and three weeks ago, I drove drunk, 
knowing I had to be somewhere at 3 p.m., I started drinking probably around 11, 12. And we're not talking just beer or wine. I mean, it was like vodka with juice, half and half. And, you know, I live in a tiny mountain town that has a two lane windy road down the mountain and up the mountain both ways. And on the way back home, I blacked out and had somebody's dog in the car with me that I had been picking up. And I think I rode the mountain home because the whole side of my truck the next morning, I went out and saw it was sideswiped. Wow. Yeah. So I'm pretty lucky I didn't die or kill anybody else or hit anybody else. Kill the dog I was with. And so yourself. We, yeah. And myself. So when I told my husband, and that's a whole nother story, five days after it happened, he just, and you know, this goes back to the, he's a keeper. He said, well, let's go look at the truck. It's cosmetic. At least you're okay. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, you know, we've still been through a lot, even through my sober journey. But yeah, I mean, he's, he's pretty understanding and he's, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's a good guy. So is it in a sober journey, like you said, and like I told you before we started to show that I am not an addict, so I've never suffered with this part of it. I've had the trauma and stuff and I've, I'm sure if you want to count cigarettes as addiction, stuff like that, but never the alcohol or the drugs. Is it, what's it like day to day as uh, you're only a week in um, a year and three weeks, you said? Yes. A year and three weeks. So how do you fill those gaps now? What are you doing different to make sure you don't go back? Everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, everything. I had to change uh, everything. I had to change my friends. My friends now are all in AA or they're people that were my friends that don't drink now. And that's not very many of them. Um, I had to go to meetings every single day. I, that's what I do now. I go to a meeting every single morning at 6.45 in the morning. I, I, and I look forward now to waking up and having coffee and not leftover wine from the night before. <laughs> yeah, so I go to meetings and I, I reach out to other alcoholics during the day. I talk to my sponsor. Um, we used to be on a daily uh, talk, but now we're on, you know, just kind of every other day, every three days, unless something's going on. Um, you know, and I'm a dog sitter and I have a small farm. And so, you know, I'm always outside and, you know, I just, I, I'm always busy. So I just, you know, I just really try to fill my time all day with Alcoholics Anonymous, really. So, well, so Fred, your question, I think is a really valid one because most people <clears throat> who find themselves anesthetizing themselves uh, during the day or at night, and then they're impaired after that infusion of, you know, the uh, anesthesia, it's, it takes up the whole day. I mean, when you think about it, when I put my hours together that I spent, you know, something to wake up, something to get through the day, something to, to come down at the end of the day, something to go back up for the mid evening, and then something to go to sleep, I was impaired almost 18 hours a day, which means the only time I wasn't under the influence when I was sleeping and when I was sleeping, you know, I was still impaired because the stuff doesn't leave your system right away. And that's something that people really don't understand. You know, it's like a broken arm. You set it a couple of weeks later, you know, you're doing some physical therapy and get off the cast and go to a brick. But with this disease of addiction, it just doesn't go away. You have to find how to live your life a new way. And, you know, Lee's probably one of the shining examples of you know listening to what everyone's told her i mean probably everyone because she's she's on it i mean starting the morning and she's of service she volunteers she gets on the phone she sees people she travels around visits takes phone calls from people probably whenever they call i'm sure yes and it, it has replaced some of those behaviors with new ones now that takes time 
And when you start to replace things, you, you know, that's assuming you, you never had a good time when you're under the influence. And most of us remember the good times. We forget about the bad. And that's why it takes months and years to really get cemented in the path of recovery. And I don't think people understand that. I mean, and well, you said it. How long did it take you to get a year and three weeks? Yeah. Years, I mean, 12 years? That, right. That's interesting, Scott, because, you know, I was just talking to my friend this morning that was picking up her dog. And, you know, um, I had mentioned I was going to be in a podcast. She says, oh, what is it? I didn't tell her I was in the program until just now. And so I, she, and she just got back from Sonoma and she said to me, if I have to drink another glass of wine, I think I'll puke. And I'm like, and to me, I was like, oh, thank God I'm not that anymore. Right. And so she started asking me questions. She said, well, how long did it take for you to not want something to drink? So these are the things that I love about the program, about being an addict and, a, and an alcoholic, really, is that I don't have the answers, but I can show people by the way I'm living, you know, and what I'm doing, that there's an easier way, you know, and I, I mean, it's just a gift. I, I can't even... I don't know. I, you know, they say in alcoholic synonymous, we have a, we have a saying called, um, what is it? Uh, attraction rather than promotion. Right. And so we don't go around saying, I'm an AA, woo, woo, you know, come join me. You know, we just live AA and people start noticing a difference in us and a change and a serenity and a peace. Um, and uh, then they start wondering, you know, where that comes from. Yeah. So, and, Scott, and, Scott yeah. would you, uh, you had mentioned you knew Lee for a long time. And you've known her more under the influence than you've known her not under the influence, correct? Well, I, our, our time was scattered because she was under the influence and I was not spending time with people that were under the influence. So just because it, it's 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 a false positive, I don't really want to be around. And when we would when we'd meet, we'd have little reunions, and I wasn't sure she'd even remember that we'd meet. And you know, I cared enough about her to let her know that when she said, "What do you think?" and I, you know, I, I'm not going to flip her switch. She's got to flip her switch. And you know, so but she seemed very um, committed to her journey. So you know, sometimes you just have to get in the back seat and be a passenger. And, you know, she's lucky she made it. I mean, not, not everybody does. And when you, you go to enough meetings, you know, like I have, and you started to, Lee, you, you hear the stories, you know, where's, where's Bobby? I mean, you know, yes. he was just here. Well, he went out and, you know, got arrested and we don't know what's going on and we hope to see him soon. Not, not everybody makes it. And statistically, um, the majority of people will relapse before they'll get, an, you know, connected days together of, of sobriety. And in the fellowship, what you hear is you hear examples of what works and you also hear examples of what's not working. And then you have to sort that out. But the social model, the social model of the fellowship of recovery, and there's myriads of type. You know, we've talked about this spread from alcohol to methamphetamine has their own meetings, cocaine anonymous, debtors anonymous, gamblers anonymous, sex anonymous. And, you know, you may have to go to multiple meetings. I did because I had a drug problem and an alcohol problem and a debt problem and a bit of a gambling problem. And then methamphetamine and then cocaine. It's like, you know, 19 different meetings a week just to be, <laughs> to find a place that I felt at home. And what people would say, we will love you until you can you know, love yourself, you know, and you'll see how Fred closes our show. And that's what it's from, Fred, is it, I could not do anything for myself except anesthetize myself. I could not process my feelings. I was numb. I had a disease of denial. I didn't even know what a disease was until my first week in treatment. I just thought that if I wasn't depressed, I wouldn't have to drink. So and Lee, the, in, in a if you want to be a little honest here, I, yeah. I have an interesting question. 
that I would assume happens. So we're talking a year and three weeks. Can you tell me the closest you've come to relapse? Like, have you ever pulled into the, like the liquor store or anything like that? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you three times. Um, right okay. So one was, um, about, uh, right before my nine months. Well, let me, let me tell you in the very beginning when, when I told my husband that I was getting sober, he was so supportive. He kind of, I was a little pissed, but he went and threw out all the alcohol in the house. And the reason why I say I was a little pissed is because there was a brand new bottle of really good vodka, right? Okay. Only an alcoholic will know that, you know, about that. But we threw out all the alcohol in the house, everything, except two bottles of whiskey that were opened in the garage one was given to him by like a family thing right and then the other one is we're Steelers fans so it's like a Steelers bottle of whiskey right I got them out or he had gotten them out I think they were sitting right there on the ground and I saw them and I'm I opened it it's like boop. oh man as soon as I smelled it <sighs> put that pot back on because I knew and I don't even know why I opened it. Have I mean, it. these, these are the things there is no answer why we're addicted, you know? And, um, yeah. Then the other time, um, the other time was I had a dream I was drinking and um, I was not in a very good spot. I was feeling really lonely and just, you know, all these things that we do in our head. And I was driving by a liquor store I used to go to. And I thought to myself, I could stop and get a couple of beers and nobody would know. And I didn't. But that's, that's the messed up thinking. You know, and going back to kind of what Scott was talking about, about, you know, you know, changing what you do and how did you do it? Um, you know, I mean, I had to really change everything. And it takes I always say, you know, it takes uh, 21 days to make or break a habit. But when you're an alcoholic and you've been an alcoholic for, you know, 40 plus years, it's going to take a lot longer than 21 days to change your thinking, change your habit, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's very, it's very tough, but it's, it's very rewarding. What about as a parent and grandparent, the, Ooh. you got your children for the most of their lives, they knew you as an alcoholic. So did they even know you were an alcoholic or were you just that person? I, you know, I, they didn't know I was an alcoholic, um, until I, until they moved out of the house and started having kids of their own. Um, I had a situation with my daughter and this, this was pretty bad. You know, it was my, my grandson who's six now, his first Christmas. And I had, I drank way too much and I embarrassed everybody. She had, you know, her first Christmas, everybody at the house, and she could not wait for me to leave. She called me the next day and told me all these things I did that I don't remember. And she told me she needed a break from me. She didn't talk to me for six months. Wow, that's hard. I yeah, I didn't see my grandkids for six months. And then out of embarrassment, I didn't talk to her for probably another six months. Yeah, that was, that's bad, you know, um, but my, my kids and I have a really, really good relationship now. They're both very proud of me. I've made my amends to them specifically. And, you know, I think as a mom, you know, your kids n love you no matter what. And, you know, I, I, I'm just really blessed that they're, you know, so supportive. Yeah, it's a it is hard when you're the parent 
and they become the parent. Yeah. You know, and those, but the embarrass the word embarrassment is just the word alone sends shivers down me because I've been there because I do one thing I am is a deflector, obviously. I deflect with comedy, which could be at a funeral. It could be off putting, but I don't I don't get emotional. I deflect it. I I hide it behind a clown or whatever. But those could create embarrassing moments for other people, especially when it's, let's say, your daughter's husband's family, <laughs> you know, or or something like that. People that they've got this false impression of you. So they've undersold you and then you go and do that. And it, it's <laughs> got it, it, you know, but so everything's good now. Yes, I have a wonderful relationship with my kids and my grandkids. Um, you know, my oldest granddaughter is going to be 16 in a couple of weeks, which is just crazy. And, um, you know, and so I'm just blessed to be able to be a good role model for her. Is she aware? Is she aware? Yes. Her, my daughter told her I was an Alcoholics Anonymous because they visit. Um, and stay with me and I pop into my meeting. And so when I tell my daughter, you know, she of course tells her and, you know, she's very proud of me. She's very, she's very proud of me. Her and I are very close. That's she's important. Very- that, that's important. Maybe, maybe not for you or me or Scott, but that's somebody that you might've impressed upon who can help change this world and what we think of addiction of addiction and addicts. Maybe she looks, maybe she looks at people, you know, more caring, you know, about them. Yes. She is very empathetic. And I think that one of the main things that I impress upon her is um, what integrity is. And I've always told my kids this as well. And they've always remembered it. Integrity is doing the right thing when nobody else is watching. Right. You know, and so, you know, I told her that, you know, in the in the throes of my addiction, you know, I was drinking by myself. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, it was only hurting myself. And, you know, so um, it's just it's I'm just incredibly proud um, of myself. And that I can be a good role model for my kids. Because I wasn't always, I didn't always show up for my kids as well. You know, their dad and I were divorced, you know, young. And um, although him and I have remained friends, you know, throughout this whole time, and we still are now, um, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it's tough on kids. It's, it's really tough on kids. It so. is, because they could act out in similar fashions. Yeah. In today's world, it's, I mean, I hate to use the word you're lucky where you fell into your addiction because that cocaine is now laced with things that we didn't have to worry about. Yes. As much. Very lucky. You know, we're lucky. I guess the word's lucky. It's not really luck, but it's just we didn't have anything to do with it. So, unfortunately. Right. As lucky as Russian roulette could get, Right. right? Unfortunately, Scott hasn't been this quiet and non-speaking in a long time. And he has a, in our contract, it says he has to be heard every four minutes. So we have to allow him to speak now because he charges me otherwise, like a doctor does by the minute. So, Scott, what do you want to add? Well, I know we're getting ready to wrap up. So two things. First, a question, then an assignment. What is it we haven't asked you, Lee, that we should? What is it you'd like someone to know about you that we haven't asked you that you think people should know or you'd want to share? You know, when I first came into these rooms, thanks for asking me that, Scott. Um, I wanted to save my ass when I first came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I saved my life with Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I think that, you know, I listened to your podcast last week and it, you know, you talked about uh, mental health in San Diego and, and all these things. 
When I first started coming in the rooms, the main thing I love to talk about was mental health is the, you know, uh, mental diseases like depression, anxiety, bipolar. I suffered de from depression. I've taken me medication since I was a teenager on and off throughout my whole life. And, you know, I don't know if, you know, statistically, Scott, you may know, you know, the statistics between mental disease and addiction. But I just, you know, I beat it. I beat the addiction, but the mental disease is something I'll have for the rest of my life, right? Um, if I don't take medication. So for me, for AA, I have to go to a meeting for the rest of my life. That's my AA pill. You know, this this is serious business. And I think just, you know, the main thing is, you know, if you're suffering from any kind of mental disease, you know, get help for that. I mean, I don't know everything, but I can suggest just to get help and start therapy at least, you know, and they can point you in the right direction. I mean, I guess that's what I want to do with my A. I, I just love being of service. And I'm just, I'm really um, proud to, and honored to join you guys today and talk about, you know, breaking the stigma of addiction and what it looks like and what it feels like. I do have a, I have one question, Scott, real hang quick. On, hang on, Fred, I get my two minutes. There was, a, yeah. there was a question I asked and then she has an assignment. Before I give you the assignment, though, I want to remind our viewers that this is a family disease. And that if you're the person who's suffering from the addiction, in many ways, you know, you're slowly killing yourself. It just, there's no way around it. That's what science says. And when that happens in a family, people around you, they wa they're watching it. They're seeing it. They don't, they don't know what to call it. They don't put a label on it, maybe. But, you know, mom ain't right. You know, mom wakes up sad. And by, you know, midday in the garden, she's flying around, you know, like, uh, Cinderella mm -hmm. or, you know, Tinkerbell or somebody. <laughs> so I want to remind people that. And then the last thing is, then you're going to go, Fred, is your, your assignment is to share with people before we sign off. Fred does that because people will see this and they're going to go, oh, it was easy for her. You know, she had her kids weren't bad kids. Her husband supported her. But. Over time, if you had not sought help, none of that would be here today. Kids would be gone. Your significant other would have left because you would have kept doing things, driving people away, not understanding why people didn't understand you. But, and the stigma is, it's this is the only illness on the planet that we look at like this. Brain tumors, cancer heart disease, you know, kidney replacement, losing a limb, having a speech impediment, or losing our hearing. Or Nobody judges you for that. But when it comes to this disease of addiction, people still think that people choose to do this and that, it, 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 you know, it's not a moral failing. It's not. Okay. So sure. what are those three things real quick that you want? If people watch this, what would you want to tell them? You know, um, I just want to tell you that I love you and there's help. And if you have just, if anything has um, felt what we've said, Scott, Fred, or I, um, about addiction, about family diseases, you know, addiction in the family, you know, reach out for help. There's an AA hotline. It's open 24 seven. You can just Google it or Bing it or whatever you do. Um, there's help and I love you and you can do it. Well, that's perfect for the sign off then, Scott, isn't it? The perfect opportunity to say, this is your crisis coach, Scott H. Silverman and me, Fred Carroll. And all we do here is we, we try to talk about the hard to talk about. It, these aren't subjects that are brought up in entertainment value or anything like that. Scott and I do this because we in, 
we enjoy it selfishly. We enjoy helping others. You know, there is a little ego that goes into it and stuff. Scott's a little bigger than mine. He's a famous guy. He's a Mr. San Diego, (laughs) you know? So before we go, if nobody has told you they love you today, we love you. And that is it. We will be back next week. Thank you very much, Lee. I'm going to ask you a question off the air because my question I realize is more pertinent off the air. So we will do that. So hang out there. Goodbye, everyone.